Well, since I come from BYU, Hawaii, I should say aloha. Aloha. Okay, I see some people here that I absolutely need to introduce to you. You're the Bowmans over there, okay? Campbell over here, and that uh, handsome young man back there is my oldest son, Flavio. Uh, I was looking for you, what, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Good to see you. Haven't been able to see each other yet since I landed two days ago, but I'm um, glad you could make it. Uh, is Hannah here with you? Oh, too bad. Hannah is uh, his oldest daughter. She's 12 years old. She's coming back from her first young women's camp. So I would, I would love to have uh, Hannah here. But um, by the way, Flavio is uh, also an ordained bishop in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, a few years ago, he served as a bishop in Eagle Mountain. And, and I mention this not because I'm dad bragging about my boy, but because, uh, you know, for a lot of you historians, and especially because we're talking about the 40th anniversary of the Revelation, here you have uh, the Martins family with three generations of bishops. My father, the late Alvestio Martin, served as a bishop in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I also served, my first time as a bishop was also in Rio de Janeiro, the second time was in Hawaii, and my son was a bishop in Eagle Mountain. Um, and so you have three generations in the Martins family uh, having served as bishops. And since we're celebrating this uh, 40th anniversary, I thought, you know, it's kind of cool to, to have something like this happening. But anyway, I want to thank Paul for the introduction. I know I wrote it, but every time I hear it, I said, man, I've done all that. <laughs> or sometimes I even say the introduction was so good that for a moment I thought somebody else was going to speak. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to be here. You know, it's a, truly a great honor to be uh, associated with uh, this event. It's uh, really great and seeing so many friends, especially our elder statement, as I call him, Dorios Graves. Wonderful to see you again, brother, and wonderful to hear your message uh, uh, yesterday to us. And uh, I want to give a special thanks to President Barnard Silver, who I only met two days ago. I went to the temple uh, Thursday night, and I didn't know him before. And uh, since then, I read about him and I said, man, I didn't know I was speaking to somebody so important in the history of the church, especially in, the, in Cote d'Ivoire in Africa. Thank you very much for your warm uh, uh, welcome to me in the, in the temple. It was really uh, one of the highlights of this trip. Unfortunately, my wife is not here with me. Um, um, she had to take a final exam at BYU Hawaii. And also, she's coming to visit the grandchildren for a couple of weeks, and um, uh, so uh, she's not with me. I'm flying solo this time. But uh, anyway, at this hour, she's working in the temple in La Hia anyway. She would, uh, <laughs> she's not even thinking about me. But anyway, uh, once again, thank you for those of you who took time over out of your busy schedule to come here, especially those who saw my invitation with my Facebook friends and former missionaries. Um, I, I prepared something for, uh, for you that is more of a reflective um, uh, a piece. It's uh, sort of a, taking a look back at kind of experiences I've had in the last 40 years as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But in reality, this all started uh, prior to the invitation to this event. And about five months ago, I was attending a satellite broadcast for religious educators here in the tabernacle on Temple Square. And um, as I looked around the congregation, this is an annual event, as I looked around the congregation, about 3,000 people were in attendance that evening. I noticed that I was the only black person in the audience. All those white faces there and was the only one. Sure, there was another uh, 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 black person. It was a, there was a brother in the choir. There was a 350-person choir. It was, one, it was not a tabernacle choir, but it was a 350-voice choir. And this brother in the choir. But in the, in, the, in the audience, in the congregation, I was the only one. I saw some uh, uh, colleagues and acquaintances who either had served in Brazil or who had served in Hawaii, at BYU Hawaii, in Laia with me. 
they all you know, greeted me very cordially, very warmly, uh, respectfully. But one of them was a brother named Burnell Hunt. Uh, brother Hunt and his wife, years ago, served as a missionary couple uh, at BYU Hawaii in Laie. They were, uh, he was stationed in my department, I was the department chair at the time, and he was uh, serving as one of our uh, uh, visiting faculty. And Brother Hunt was now confined to a wheelchair. But when I saw him in the tabernacle and I greeted him, he, he, he said, uh, said he, he demanded to receive my embrace. And he said, uh, I, I want a hug from you, like that. I want a hug from you. Somehow, on my flight back to Hawaii, my long six-hour flight back to Hawaii, and thinking about the, you know, proximity of these celebrations with the 40th anniversary of the revelation of the priesthood, that led me to think about what had just happened in the tabernacle uh, and what kind of insights I've gained about race relations, not only race relations, you know, from a sociological standpoint, but also my own experiences with race relations but in a religious environment that is shaped by extraordinary claims of heavenly ministrations and divine guidance. Most of my experiences as a member of the church have been good and inspirational, I should add. But unfortunately, not all of them were that positive, and many speakers in this conference have already reminded us of that, and others will yet remind us of that, and they're going to show us some of the challenges we have ahead of us as a people. So let me talk, just then ad first address these uh, experiences with race in society and in the church. My experience with race relations go back almost 60 years. And um, I grew up, as uh, you heard in the introduction, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 1960s and 70s. And either in my neighborhood or at school, there were always other children, other classmates, or even teachers who treated me with different levels of disdain. Fortunately, it seems that in Brazil, class status supersedes uh, racial status uh, up to a certain point. And since my father was a, uh, an executive, in fact, a very high executive in the National Oil Company, we were insulated from worse treatment that uh, was experienced by many other uh, persons uh, uh, with black African ancestry in Brazil. And, and by the way, this is where my experiences as a black man in Brazil, differ significantly from the experiences from, uh, of my, from my African-American counterparts. I was insulated from some of the worst expressions of racism, but not all of them. Perhaps what my father taught me uh, when I was still a boy uh, might be emblematic of this point I'm trying to make. Uh, sometime in the 1960s, uh, he was at some kind of festivity for, in the National Oil Company, all the, all the executives of the National Oil Company. And uh, at some point in that activity, he told me one of his associates, a fellow manager, very much intoxicated at that point, turned to him and said, Vasu, you are a beep, but you smell good. So that tells us a little bit what this whole thing about that you hear in Brazil, racial democracy and so on. Yes, on the surface, it is a racial democracy, but you dig a little bit and uh, it is there. So joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in July of 1972, in fact, July 2nd, now this Tuesday is going to be 46 years, brought my parents and I into a new and rather unique situation. We were very well received in church. I, I recall that even during the two months in which my parents and I were attending meetings as investigators, members of our branch, including the youth, they would come to greet us. In fact, they would not even wait for us to come inside the building. They would get out of the building and come to greet us still uh, uh, you know, outside of the building. 
very warmly and very, very uh, uh, lovingly, really. Yet, behind that genuine and warm friendliness hanged the spectrum of what I call the pseudo-doctrines used to explain the existence of the priesthood ban. Looking in retrospect, I would say that the ban itself was not a major problem for me. Not at all. It didn't bother me that much that I could not receive the priesthood. Although I was only 13 years old, I soon received a testimony, that conviction, that the message and doctrines that, uh, of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, that the full-time missionaries had taught us were true. And I decided to be baptized even before my fathers made up their minds. And I had a strong faith that if I kept the commandments, God someday would have some, some good reward for me in heaven. What did bother me somewhat back in those days were those pseudo-doctrines used to justify the ban. I had grown up in a very religious family, and uh, I loved God, I always revered Him, and so it didn't make sense to me that someone who was so God-fearing on earth would have been less than completely faithful or less valiant in the presence of God in the pre-mortal realm. Uh, yet, that's what all the members of the church had been taught to believe as truth, and I joined them in that belief. However, those pseudo-doctrines had a major impact in our religious life. They opened the door for all kinds of ideas that today may sound terrible. For example, my wife Mira and I uh, started dating in 1976, and I, I wish I could show a picture of her here. Uh, she's white, okay? Some of you have seen my pictures on cyberspace somewhere with her. She's white, and you can see my son there. You know, he's good looking. That's my wife's DNA, responsible for that. <laughs> well, I have to be humble once in my life, right? <laughs> so uh, when Mira and I started dating in 1976, my stake president uh, expressed to me the concern that without the prospect of being married in the temple, I had no chance of receiving exaltation. And by marrying me, Miriam will lose her exaltation. When she finished her full-time mission in 1978, uh, in the final interview with her mission president, he expressed his concern that by marrying me, she would become less active in the church. Make no mistake, these were good men. And as leaders, they were doing the best they could. In fact, uh, Brother Dorayo spoke about that yesterday. It's like they were doing the best they could with the limited information they had available to them, which oftentimes amounted much more to hearsay than anything else. But one may still ask, how can somebody say something like that to a 17-year-old or to a 21-year-old who is a faithful, active member of the church? To put it this in good terms, one can say that the leaders who acted in those ways, they were acting in, in, they were acting in good faith. But I would add that it was good faith in bad doctrine. I confess that my feelings are still unsettled about this. Here and there, we hear that testimonies of people, in fact, I had a phone call with a brother from the missionary department who served in Brazil uh, in, the, in the early 70s, just early this week, I believe it was uh, Monday of this week, he called me in, in Hawaii and uh, and, and I got this from him, and it was not the first time. We hear testimonies of people who heard this or that apostle uh, state back in the early 1970s that there had been no less valiant people in the pre-mortal realm. To which I ask, why weren't those statements published to the entire church back then? I suppose some may say, or some may have argued, that uh, we weren't ready to hear those things at that time. But that supposition is flawed, 
because it essentially states that we were ready to hear racist views disguised as doctrine, but not ready to hear the pure doctrine. Actually, in my, in my notes here, it doesn't say applause, but thank you. <laughs> cool. uh, did, did you, film, you should have filmed that, you know. Uh, you know your, your, your grandmother's gonna love this. <laughs> my mother read a, a very early draft of this, and she was, are you going to say that? Are you going to say, are you crazy? And then she came with a little poem there, you know, don't, don't have hurt govern your heart or something. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, you ought to call your grandmother and tell her, no, people applauded him when he said that. <laughs> sure, no, your mother liked it, but your grandmother, she, she oh my goodness, you know, whatever. <laughs> I said, oh, almost made, made me repent of bringing her to live with me, but anyway, uh, uh, don't say that to her. <laughs> now, I am glad that finally those pseudo-doctrines, as I call them, were declared to be, at best, merely the result of uninspired speculation mixed with prevailing social prejudices. But then, silly me, I also have to ask, why did it take 35 years after the revelation for such statements to be made public? Yeah, it's just why, right, you know, sociologists, you know, yeah, complicators of the world. They said, oh, yeah, why don't you, you're not just glad that, oh, yeah, I'm glad we have the, the, that race and the priesthood essay, but why did it take 35 years? Yeah. Anyway, now, I consider those old pseudo doctrines or rationales for the priesthood ban as far more harmful than the ban itself. Their powerful influence still lingers decades after the end of the ban. They provided a clear conduit through which prevailing social prejudices could creep into and pollute the culture of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. The priesthood ban and its associate, associated pseudo-doctrines effectively disavowed the scriptures. They contradicted the scriptures. Let me give you a couple of examples. In, in, the, in, in the scriptures, in the Bible we read, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Well, according to the ban and its rationale, black Africans inherited the curse of Cain. The worth of souls is great in the sight of God. But then the ban would say, well, some are cursed. We also find in the scriptures, it's part of the Abrahamic covenant, they shall bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations. The instructions given to Thomas B. Marsh, the first president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in 1835, was that they were to bear testimony of my name and send it abroad among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. The band would say, not all nations. The Book of Mormon states, he invited them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none black and white, and all are alike unto God. Well, the ban would say, well, black Africans are excluded from this scripture. Our belief is that uh, there is a veil that prevents us from remembering events from our pre-mortal uh, existence. And prophets have taught very little about it. In fact, of all the doctrines, uh, in the doctrine of the plan of salvation, the section of the doctrine dealing with the pre-mortal life is the one that we know the least about. And yet, people were pretty sure, they were positive that blacks messed up in the pre-existence. So, I have a couple of vignettes now that illustrate how the influence of those pseudo-doctrines allowed prejudices to creep into our religious practice, our religious life, at times in violation of basic principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, these stories represent a very small sample, very small sample, okay, of a number of, 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 you know, of rare negative experiences I had in my life. And, and I do not bring them up to complain, but rather to exemplify how the intersection of racism and religion can easily perpetuate stereotypes 
and negative behaviors despite people's lofty desires for righteousness. So the first one goes back to 1978, December 16, 1978 to be exact. I was serving as a full-time missionary in the Brazil Sao Paulo North Mission. See, like most Latter-day Saints, uh, my parents and I also rejoiced when the revelation on the priesthood was announced. I expected, you know, I was 19 years old at the time, I expected that I would be considered equal to my peers in the church in every way. Sadly, a few months later, I discovered that the lasting influence of those pseudo-doctrines, okay, combined with racial stereotypes from society, would be hard to eliminate despite the revelation. So, we were at this uh, Christmas lunch in a city in southwest Brazil on December 16, 1978. My mission zone was having uh, this luncheon with our mission president and his wife. And as part of the program, we had this secret friend activity. We had uh, bought a small, you know, you know, an expensive Christmas gift, and we had cast lots, and we're supposed then to announce who our secret friend was uh, uh, during that lunch. And, um, and then we would disclose who the person was by imitating the person. Yeah, you know where this is going, right? Yeah. <laughs> This is the PG-13 part of the thing here, okay? Yeah, a few minutes into the activity, one of the elders, a southern Brazilian, okay? So Americans, you're off the hook, okay? <laughs> a southern Brazilian, okay, uh, stood up, picked it up a banana, peeled it, started eating and imitating a monkey. All the elders and sisters in that lunch immediately started to laugh and yell, Elder Martins, that's Elder Martins. Well, I bowed my head, looking at my plate for a moment, and I murmured, that's not me. But one of the elders sitting across the table from me, another Southern Brazilian, so we're still off the hook, he said, of course it's you, go get your gift. So I paused for a couple of seconds, and then slowly stood up and made my way to the front of the room. What was I supposed to do? Beat up the guy? Spit on his face? No. Okay, the show had to go on. And I didn't want to give that, you know, a validation to that stereotype of the angry black man. So I just went, received my gift, and then I announced my, my secret friend without doing an imitation. The actual thoughts I had on that day, um, uh, you know, 40 years ago have long been forgotten. In fact, I, I, I was surprised to notice that I did not even record this incident in my journal. I mentioned that we had the lunch and, uh, on that day, but I did not mention what had happened. Maybe it was too painful for me to reflect on that and actually write about it. But I came out of that incident with two insights that sadly exemplify the nature and typical aftermath of such incidents in the lives of black Latter-day Saints. First, my fellow members of the church in that group were not considering me as their equal, despite the recent revelation and my subsequent ordination as an elder. Secondly, I could not count on my priesthood leader, in that case, my mission president, to change that state of affairs. At the luncheon, he said nothing. I expected him to say something in my defense, but he didn't. He and his wife just sat there in silence. And the supreme irony, 33 years later, out of that group of missionaries, I would be the one called to be one of his successors presiding that same mission. But the thought remains, could that event in December of 1978 be a sign of things to come? How long would it take for members of the church in general to cast aside the remnants of racial prejudice, especially when for a century or a little over a century, those remnants had been widely accepted as inspired teachings? The second experience, the second vignette, this happened in 1995, while I was a part-time lecturer at a church university. 
One administrator one afternoon suggested to me indirectly and very discreetly at a chance encounter on campus that I could not be a full-time faculty there because my wife was white. What? Teaching at that great university for a few mortal and imperfect years would cost me my precious ceiling to that angel that God had placed in my life to refine me, perfect me, and one day glorify me eternally? I didn't even blink before I knew the answer. Now, please, don't misunderstand me. I'm not complaining nor exposing grievances. My intent is to demonstrate how prejudices that prevailing society can easily find their way into our religious life, and how the long-lasting influence of those pseudo-doctrines that supported the priesthood ban function as a, a welcome mat to those prejudices. As we recall experiences like this, we see three types of responses to race issues, and these responses are not unique to Latter-day Saints. First, we see those who, consciously or not, hold on to centuries-old racist attitudes and beliefs. Secondly, we see those who see racist actions and simply dismiss them as innocuous. Uh, they're merely funny or accidental actions or remarks that are really not meant to hurt, and that people target, the people target, should put that behind them. Third, we see those who are the intended targeted, uh, targets of disparaging remarks and, and disrespectful actions who keep saying, how am I supposed to put this garbage behind me when wild people keep throwing it in my face again and again? <laughs> this is the time you should have said, ooh. But okay, I'll, I'll take the applause. I'll, I'll take the applause, okay? That's good. Another one for your grandma, okay? <laughs> they applauded twice, grandma, okay? I think she will sleep better tonight. <laughs> now, today, I still don't blame, I don't cast blame on anyone. I have a forgiving heart and that resists holding grudges. Still, I recognize significant events whenever that happened. And that's why when Brother Burnell Hunt asked me to hug him in the tabernacle, I immediately thought, this is a big deal. <laughs> but regardless of the nature of my personal experiences, the 1978 revelation of the priesthood demands that we recognize two unavoidable aspects of life in any religious tradition on the earth, the humanity of the people and the humanity of the prophets. Let's talk about the humanity of the people first. In the Book of Mormon, we read an angel's declaration that the natural man is and will be forever and ever an enemy to God unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the history of the world, racism and prejudice have been powerful and pervasive forces. At times, racial prejudice came to be accepted as a normal and integral part of the human experience. And it may very well continue to exist for as long as there are racist ideologies to justify and reinforce such base feelings of racial pride and superiority and national leaders who use them for self-serving purposes. Racism is absurd. Recalling the time of her childhood, and I'm gonna quote Maya Angelou also, okay? Recall, recalling the time of her childhood, celebrated author Maya Angelou, jokingly said that racism was so prevalent in her hometown that a Negro could not buy vanilla ice cream. <laughs> yes, she said that. They could only buy uh, uh, chocolate ice cream. They would allow them to buy vanilla ice cream on the 4th of July only. Okay, so racism is absurd, and that's just an example. And I believe that racism is likely to continue to exist until millennial conditions elevate humanity to a, to a terrestrial state where the knowledge of the Lord, as Isaiah prophesied, would permeate the world and bring an end to all enmity. All I can do right now is my part in aspiring and, as and striving to anticipate that terrestrial condition in my own mind. 
During the years of the priesthood ban, people lived in an environment marked by a perennial denial of respect and worth towards blacks. And it would have taken a miracle for someone to suddenly believe in full equality. And miracles happened, and they did happen. But uh, they were not that wide, widespread, unfortunately. And in the church, the pseudo-doctrines that were created to justify the priesthood ban and the way they were widely accepted as heavenly truths were just as widespread and long-lasting as racism itself. In the latter day Saint scriptures, we learn that God commanded people in all ages that they should love one another and that they should choose him as their father. But rejecting divine truths, they became without affection and they hated their own blood. And as a result, prejudice, racism, and slavery have been present in the world almost from the beginning. Because for, of these conditions, for millennia, entire races, black, sometimes white, and others, experienced a certain measure of the same tribulations that the Lord Jesus Christ himself would suffer in greater magnitude during his mortal ministry. And those races were despised and rejected of men, becoming people of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Quoting Isaiah here. Indeed, a parallel can be established between the epithets used against the Savior and the modern day expressions used to refer to black Latter day Saints. Blacks were, were called cursed. Well, the Savior was, was called a sinner. Blacks were called the descendants of Cain. The Savior was called a partner of, Be of Beelzebub. Under this light, I rejoice in the fact that I am given the honor of following Christ's footsteps in much smaller but still similar experiences. And as a divine word in modern revelation stated, the Son of Man hath descended be below them all. Art thou greater than he? Now let's talk about the humanity of the prophets. This is a topic we rarely take into consideration, but, in, but the 126th year of the priesthood ban in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the associated belief in a millennia old curse of Cain befalling people of black African ancestry forces us to consider that humanity of the prophets at the beginning of the 21st century. I honor and, and testify of the divine calling of all the prophets of this, of this latter day dispensation. But I also must acknowledge the humanity of those prophets. Prophets are regular people, although by virtue of their calling, often we tend to look at them as being superhuman or above and beyond the reach of social forces. Why do we expect that they would be any different from the rest of us? How could they be exempt from their own humanity? They lived and breathed the social environment around them. In moments of divinely inspired lucidity, they could, like the apostle Peter, enter the house of a Gentile to preach and baptize after being led to do so by a heavenly manifestation. But that did not prevent Peter from avoiding socializing with Gentiles whenever he was in the presence of other Jews an attitude that led the Apostle Paul to criticize Peter. How could I expect Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, Joseph F. Smith, white men from the 19th century who once saw slavery as the law of the land, suddenly and magically developed the same social consciousness of a civil rights activist from the late 20th century? We cannot judge the actions and decisions of those leaders from the 19th century using the social standards of the 21st century. And Paul, I appreciate your insight this morning on this. I believed that this man acted in good faith. But as I said before, it was good faith in bad doctrine. Personally, I try to imagine their successors in the 20th century as they grapple with this issue. As prophets, no doubt, inside, deep inside, the spark of divine inspiration must have given them some measure of doubt about the ban and its associated pseudo-doctrines, and hence the, you know, 
little snippets of information that comes from people. Oh, yeah, when I was a missionary, this apostle came, that apostle came, he said this. They said there were no less valid. Yes, there were these sparks of inspiration that led them to doubt the whole thing, the band, the associated pseudo-doctrines. But ending that policy without disavowing seemingly ironclad and widespread old social traditions and without criticizing leaders from the past may have proven to be too great a challenge for them. And so on June 1st, 1978, according to some of their own testimonies, the heavens were opened and divine power broke the chains and burned the sludge of prevailing prejudices mixed with scriptures. That revelation provided a powerful hidden lesson for the future. One cannot pay respect to the past using as currency the dignity of others in the present. Now, how do people cope? How have we coped? I think if we were to ask many of the black pioneers who are here, I think you would find something in common in all our stories. First and foremost, the importance of conviction or a testimony, and reliance in a firm faith in God. I think that would be, what, that, that would be the, 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 the feature that would permeate all our stories. All of us had to rely on that testimony, that conviction that God lives that we are his sons and daughters, that he loves us. Otherwise, we would not be here today with you. But I would also add the need for greater attention to doctrinal accuracy. So personal faith can be strengthened. 10 years ago, at the 30th anniversary of the Revelation, I offered the following thoughts, which I repeat parts of them here. One of the consequences of the 1978 revelation has been an enhanced emphasis on doctrinal accuracy. This is one of the challenges for the church in the, in the 21st century. The church, or anyone for that matter, has no control over the flow of information in cyberspace. Anyone can become, and uh, where is uh, uh, Ahmed here? Where are you? Okay. Gone. Oh, no, here, right here. I mean, I have all these lights here, couldn't see where you were. President Corbett here. You know, you're aware of this. Anyone can become an informal public affairs officer. <laughs> yeah, okay, the church, nobody has control over what people post on their, you know, uh, blogs or on their uh, social media pages. And so, we now understand more than ever, the responsibility each member of the church has to study carefully the scriptures and the words of the currently living prophets so we can make accurate statements about our beliefs on our social media pages and, and other places. And, and notice my emphasis on currently living prophets. It is easy to use online tools to find quotations from the past. But we must check those words against the teachings of the present. It doesn't matter what Brigham Young, John Taylor, or any other 19th century prophet thought about this or that racial group of nationality. We have to ask, would President Russell M. Nelson say the same thing today? Uh, would the elder D. Todd Christophers, can I imagine Elder Quentin L. Cook uh, saying the same thing today? Can I imagine uh, Elder Jeffrey L. Holland saying the same thing? And if we can we feel that disconnect, we should say, maybe I shouldn't use this in my next Sunday school class then. We ought to have this kind of consciousness, perhaps sophistication is the uh, a word also. Because for us, what matters most is what the currently living prophets and apostles teach about our status and worth as children of God. For those involved in curriculum, producing curriculum materials, a new challenge exists. Giving Latter-day Saints not only information, but the tools to study the doctrine wisely, so as to minimize the probability of local misinterpretations around the world. This is particularly significant and necessary in an era in which we see, once again, the rise of extremism in the world. 
often fueled by misconstrued religious beliefs. The vitality of Mormonism stems from its extraordinary doctrines, ordinances, and blessings, privileges, and promises contained in the, in the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Underestimating any of those would comp compromise the life of the church. Figuratively speaking, and I mean no disrespect to here, figuratively speaking, it is the sacred grove that attracts lifelong converts, not the pioneer handcart. While the handcart is the symbol of an exodus based on faith, that faith is started as a result of the heavenly visitation that took place in the sacred grove. Calling someone cursed is not a demonstration of love. And those who joined the church and remained active did so out of their faith and love for God and their hope that the pure doctrine of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ included the promise of a heavenly place in store for them. The experience of those black pioneers show the remarkable and enduring power of the doctrines of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Even with restrictions, the pure doctrine still attracts and sustains the faith of those who love God and seek his eternal blessings. And some those of you who are schooled in the New Testament, you remember the Canaanite woman. Okay, so yeah, she, she, would, she would take the, the crumbles from the table. It was better than having nothing. The great revelation on the priest received on June 1st, 1978, attest that at its heart, the religion we profess is primarily a religion of blessings, not curses. A religion not based on prejudice and segregation, but one of principles of righteousness, ordinance and, and covenants available to all humankind. The 1978 revelation also reaffirmed the truth spoken by the apostle Peter, that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That revelation powerfully implies that those who insist in holding on to prejudices against the others of a different race are like the ancient Lamanites prior to their conversion in darkness, yea, even in the darkest abyss. But yet they can, once enlightened by the Spirit of the Lord, lay down their hatred and the tradition of their fathers. Now, as we have looked into the past, let's try to take a look to the future. As I ponder about the 40th anniversary of the revelation of the priesthood, another memory that frequently comes to my mind is of my last visit in 1985 with Brother Lorival Batista, a former bishop in Rio de Janeiro. We had become acquainted a decade earlier when, as a 15-year-old, I, uh, uh, I had been a guest speaker in his ward. Just a few days before he passed away, I visited Brother Baptista at a hospital. It was a Sunday afternoon, and many brethren from his stake were in that room visiting him as well. He could no longer speak, and he was communicating with us only in writing. All of us in that room were high priests, but before I left, he wrote down a note asking me, then 26 years old, to lay my hands on his head and pronounce a priesthood blessing. About a decade earlier, he had met me as a teenager without the priesthood. Now bidding farewell to me as a fellow high priest, he granted me the honor of pronouncing one of the last priesthood blessings he would receive in mortality. It was a touching moment, as you can see, in which both of us were teary-eyed. I find in these two events, Brother Hunt's embrace in the tabernacle filled with white faces, and Brother Bautista's blessing in a room full of other white faces, my hope for the future as a black man in Zion, that not long from now, those two good experiences I had will become emblematic of the black Mormon experience as a whole, black Latter-day Saints whose presence refines and blesses white Latter-day Saints' discipleship in Christ. I interpret my call to preside at that same mission in which at one point my dignity was not defended 
as a message from the Lord to me saying, thou art my son, I have begotten thee in realms of glory, and I, the Lord, delight to honor those who serve me in righteousness and in truth. If my peers denied me their respect, the Lord compensated me amply for that. So after being considered cursed and less valiant, and after four decades since the tacit denial of the curse, I'm still a black man and a Mormon, and I'm glad and proud to be both. I conclude with the words from a great missionary and prophet from the Book of Mormon, Ammon, who was able to preach the gospel with a love that transcended racial differences. As we celebrated the 1978 revelation of the priesthood, I recall and make mine Ammon's words as they perfectly describe the feelings I have in my heart. Now we see that God is mindful of every people, whatsoever land they may be in. Yea, he numbereth his people, and his bowels of mercy are over all the earth. Now have we not reason to rejoice? Yea, I say unto you, there never were men and women that had so great reason to rejoice as we. And my joy is carried away, even unto boasting in my God. For he has all power, all wisdom, and all understanding. He comprehendeth all things, and he's a merciful being, even unto salvation, to those who will repent and believe on his name. Now, if this is boasting, even so will I boast. For this is my life and my light, my joy and my salvation, and my redemption from everlasting woe. Yea, blessed be the name of my God, who has been mindful of these people who are now restored as a branch of the tree of Israel. Yea, I say, blessed be the name of my God who has been mindful of us. Now this is my joy and my great thanksgiving. Yea, and I will give thanks unto my God forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and tell that to your grandmother too, okay? <laughs> Paul, how are you doing on time? Yeah, we don't have time. We don't have time. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Um, we don't have time for questions. We our next session starts. Oh. Just, uh, just quick, uh, for those of you who by any chance might have questions, I have some of my business cards here. There's my email there. You can get a hold of me via email there in Hawaii. Just remember, it's four-hour time zone difference, okay? But you can get one of my cards here if you want to dialogue with me. Thank you. So please join with me in thanking you again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Stokes, thank you. So honored to be in the presence of both of you here.